Uh, well, my name is Priya Morley, and I'm a second year law student at McGill, and I'm the co-chair of the International Justice Portfolio of the Human Rights Working Group, which is a student advocacy group at McGill, which is student-led and student-run, and it's about um, human rights issues, and in particular, the international justice is, deals with issues of war crimes, genocide, international criminal tribunals, and similar international human rights legal issues. Well, this year, this my portfolio, international justice, last year was actually genocide awareness and prevention um, but this year we decided to broaden the scope um, in part because there are other groups which specifically engage with genocide like the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at Concordia and furthermore because given that it's a, a law faculty and genocide is such a unique situation when dealing with it from a legal perspective that having it within a broader framework of international human rights or international law makes it not only more easier to see kind of where it fits in but also it broadens the scope in terms of how we understand human rights on an international scale. Yeah, l'interrogation qu'on a aujourd'hui euh, qu'on a eu aujourd'hui c'est euh Comment euh, peut-on mobiliser la communauté internationale à intervenir? a country of roughly the same size, the exact same ethnic composition, Tutsi minority, Hutu majority. He saw that Burundi is going to go the same way as Rwanda. So what did Howard Volpe do? Well, it wasn't F-16s bombing anyone. What he did is he set up a negotiation workshop in neighboring Nairobi, capital of Kenya, and he invited the leaders of the opposing, increasingly radicalized faction, which were about to explode into genocidal violence, and he said, please come to this workshop where I will teach you negotiation skills. So these groups were forced to sit in the same room to talk with each other, and many well-informed, sober observers, not crazy human rights activists like me, actually believe that that workshop prevented what could have been a repeat of what happened in Rwanda. And I would argue that it is this issue of the particular personalities in power that helped get you get the US government to where it got to in Libya. You have a particular set of personalities in the White House at the moment that are particularly attuned to mass atrocity prevention and what it would have meant to have had thousands of people in Benghazi killed on their watch. So you can imagine it took a lot of people to kill a million people in a poor, underdeveloped country. How was that achieved? It's a remarkable work of organization when you think about it, to kill a million people in three months. Well, the key weapon was called RTLM, Radio Television Libre de Mille A radio station was the biggest weapon at the disposal of the genocide. How can one develop narratives that perhaps encourage constituents, for example, in the US and Canada, um, to see those directly affected by atrocities, perhaps in some ways more as partners rather than as individuals who need to be solely saved or only victims, who have no future role in the, in the end of the conflict and after the conflict? And I guess my question is then, is this important? And if so, how can we bring these voices to the forefront in the process that can be both empowering and sustainable in the long run, while ensuring that we actually can have an, an effective advocacy campaign. Thank you. Three years ago, there was a huge massacre in, in Sri Lanka, and it was basically framed as a terrorism issue. How, um, how does, I guess, framing the issue, I mean, as, as terrorism, kind of subvert legitimate um, intervention into, or even bringing attention to mass atrocities? Uh, to the question on Sri Lanka, um, I, um, one interesting thing is that when the Sri Lankan, uh, this crisis happened in 2009, um, lo and behold in Canada, we discovered that Canada had the second largest Tamil diaspora in the world, and there were actually uh, major protests in Toronto, 200,000 people had actually uh, had a numerous protests in Toronto. At one point they blocked off the Gardner Expressway and, and, and forced the, the uh, then, um, uh, not Rob Ford, who's now the current mayor of Toronto, but it was, uh, and the man before that, the mayor of Toronto and the premier of Ontario, of Ontario to actually call on the Canadian government to take action. I think Canada was really caught. It wasn't, our government wasn't really on the ball in this, wasn't really paying that much attention. And then, then this is one of these kind of 
ripple effects that we see in these mass atrocities that take place in, in people's home lives that the world's in Canada now, so we have to, we have an interest in actually trying to act early to kind of help protect people. And I'm from that country called Iran, uh, where despite 4,000 years of Jewish history, President Ahmadinejad is now engaging in Holocaust denial and all of this nonsense. And it's actually very interesting to look at this because uh, Iran traditionally does not have a history of anti-Semitism, unlike Europe, unlike Europe. We have still the tomb of Esther and Mordecai, and you can read the book of Daniel and the book of Ezra, and uh, we even have this long-standing Jewish community that believed that Cyrus the Great was a Messianic figure because he funded the reconstruction of the temple in, in Jerusalem. So, and this is what is happening in the Middle East today. People are going through this historical transition, and they're realizing that a liberal culture that respects the rule of law is not about great utopias, it's about compromise. It's about diversity. So the point that I'm making here is that the rest of the Arab world, in a sense, has to suffer from these ideologies until they get to where the Iranian people are 30 years after the revolution. So just to end, I'm reminded of Jean-Paul Sartre's famous saying, which is an apt way, I think, of ending this whole discussion, where he said that the Jew exists in the mind of the anti-Semite. If the Jew did not exist, the anti-Semite would invent him. So the point <coughs> is that hatred has nothing to do with the subjectivity of the victim. Hatred is about the perpetrator. It's about the need of the perpetrator to find some pretext to absolve himself of responsibility for his own failings, for his own feelings of inferiority. And I would say that there is great hope that even in circumstances where we believe that people are so filled with hatred that they could not possibly change their mind, that those are the exact type of people that we should reach out to. Because dehumanization is about an absence of intimacy. It's about an absence of a human connection. And once people engage in dialogue, it becomes that much more difficult for the imams and extremists Justement, le centre commémoratif de l'Holocauste est en train d'organiser, euh, en collaboration avec euh, la communauté arménienne du Québec, un, un panel sur euh, le négationnisme ou la négation des génocides. On va avoir des experts qui vont parler bon, de l'Holocauste, mais aussi du génocide arménien, euh, du génocide rwandais euh, et de situations contemporaines qui, euh, qui se passent aujourd'hui, mais dont on n'entend pas parler va avoir lieu dans le cadre de la semaine d'action contre le racisme le 20 mars fort probablement.